All right, so for today, we're going to be planning a math lesson with me. So welcome. Um, if you want to follow along, just know um, I am going to be planning a second grade lesson. And so I'm working off of the grade two module four um, book as we go through today. Um, if you want to get some of the materials that I'm going to be working with today, just know that I am going to have the module overview from this module. I am going to have and use the overview of the module topics and objectives. That's kind of like the table of contents that has all of the objectives on it. Um, I'm also going to be uh, using the topic overview. In this specific uh, example, I'm going to be using topic C as I'm going to be planning lesson 14, and that happens to be in topic C. Um, I'm going to have all of the exit tickets for topic C. So those are lessons 11 through 16. And then obviously I'm going to be working off of lesson 14. So if you want to go ahead and grab these materials, feel free to pause the video and grab them. If not, feel free to just follow along. Um, know that as I go through this, um, this same process is uh, can be applied for any grade level um, in kinder through fifth grade. It's a little bit different for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and I'll have a separate video on how I plan those lessons. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I'm going to need is obviously my module overview. And um, I will admit um, I was I was not a reader and this is something that I normally just skipped and kind of zoomed past. Um, but the more that I've worked with Eureka Math and the more that I've learned to plan lessons, um, this is the one thing that I never, never skip anymore. And so what I'm doing is I'm going to go ahead and share um, my video screen here so you guys can see. So here is... Um, my module. And so what I've done is I've kind of just highlighted some stuff as I read through it. And so I like this just because in the beginning, in the, the beginning of the overview, it's going to give me some connections to previous work that we've done. So it's telling me what they've done in module three um, and what students have done. It's letting me know what the students have done in first grade and then what students did in second grade. And then it just tells me that module four, which is the module that we're working on now, builds on that place value understanding. And we're hoping that students um, can then start to decompose, compose and decompose place value units to add and subtract within 200. So now I know that we're going to be broadening their um, idea of what place value is all the way through 200. And so that's kind of what we're working on here. And then as I continue reading here, um, it's giving me main key um, components that I need to know for module four. A few things that I highlighted here is that module four is devoted to three major areas, and I've highlighted all three of them here. So the first one is building fluency in two digit addition and subtraction within 100, which is something we did in module three. Um, we're going to be applying that fluency to one and two step word problems. And so now I know that those word problems are going to be within 100. So building that fluency within those word problems. And then that third one is down here and it's uh, letting me know that we're going to be developing students' conceptual understanding of addition and subtraction of multi-digit numbers within 200. So I know that I'm going to be working heavily within that conceptual understanding. So there's going to be tons of models that I'm going to be using. So as I continue reading here, there's a few more things that it'll let me know here. It's letting me know that by the end of module three, students were using or starting to use mental addition. Um, and so it's letting me know that we're going to do the same thing for module four. And so the students will start to continue to build um, with that mental math. Um, this specific one has some examples of the actual models that students will be using. So I can see that we're going to be using a number line. We're going to be using some tape diagrams as we go through this. I can also see here that we're using place value charts um, with both the disk model and the chip model. And then I can see that we are getting into that algorithm as well. And so I like to see the different models that I'm going to be working with as I go through that. The next thing um, that's on here as well that I always try to make a note of and you can see here is that every single module overview will have some notes on on pacing now this is important if I'm falling behind in pacing or if I just want to see which lessons I want to focus on a little bit more so for this particular module there's nothing for topic C unfortunately and so as I plan my lesson I know that my uh, lesson 14 which is the one I'm planning is just going to have to be one of those lessons that stay the same but it does let me know that I might want to consider pacing um, the lessons that follow topic A a little bit quick, uh, more quickly, just because students tend to get that a little bit, e it's easier concepts, and so I can move a little bit faster through those. Um, and then it also lets me know that I could consider omitting lessons 29 and 30 as I get into those. But again, my focus today is lesson 14, so I'm not going to get into that quite yet. So once I have my module overview completed, 
Um, then I get into the module, um, the overview for the module topics and the lesson objectives. Now, like I mentioned earlier, I am going to be focusing on lesson 14. And so I can see here that lessons 14 and 15 actually share the same um, objective, which is represent subtraction with and without the decomposition when there is a three digit minuend. And so as I'm focusing and working through planning lesson 14, um, I'm going to keep in mind that this is the first time that students will do this, but that they also have lesson 15 to continue working on this skill set if it's something that they still need. Um, really quickly before I move on to as well is um, I like to see here that topic C is actually the last topic before I get into my mid-module assessment. And so as I'm planning my lesson, I'm going to make sure that I keep in mind that um, the mid-module assessment will come about two lessons after the one I do. So something to keep in mind as I plan. All right. The next thing I get into when I'm planning a lesson is the topic overview. And now the topic overview is important because it gives me a little bit more information apart from what I've already read in the module overview. So I'm going to bring up my screen again. And so you can see here that I've already kind of um, put some notes on here. So I can see that topic C parallels topic B. And so if I've already taught topic B, I know that topic C is going to follow the same patterns. Um, I can see here that we're going to be moving from concrete to pictorial, to abstract. And so I'm going to be making that transition for students and walking them through the entire process. Um, and I like this note that says here that even though students are working with the algorithm, um, fluency with the algorithm is a fourth grade standard. So even though I am using the algorithm with my second graders, I'm not going to hold them accountable to being completely fluent with that. Um, and they can still use uh, those different strategies and models if needed. So I could go ahead and read through here. There's some notes for lesson 11. There's some notes for lesson 12. Um, like I said, I'm focusing on lesson 14. And so I'm going to read the portion that has lesson 14 on it, since that's my focus. So I can see here that students are continuing to work with the chip model, which means students um, have already worked with that chip model before, um, but that the focus will be that chip model. Um, and it's letting me know here that students will use the same procedure for decomposing a 10 and relating it to the vertical form, and that students um, are going to be subtracting two digit subtrahends from a three digit minuend, so something like 164 minus 36. And so this will just give my students some practice with, um, with drawing three digit numbers without that complexity of having to decompose the 100 yet. So they're only going to de be decomposing on that tens. So that's important for me to know. And then here's some examples in case I wanted to see that. So that's, that's that topic overview. Once I'm done with that topic overview, what I like to do next is get into all of my exit tickets. And I mentioned earlier that I'm going to be working with the exit tickets for the entire topic, so lessons 11 through 16. And so again, I'm going to pull up my screen here. And so I've already worked on these. I have a blank version here, but I've already worked on these. And so you can see here that as I worked through lesson 11 exit ticket, I did my place value disk since that's what it asked me for. And I am solving this as, um, as I expect my students to be able to solve it. So I went ahead and drew my place values. Um, for my students, I might actually have them use the actual disk themselves instead of drawing it. But I obviously went ahead and drew it here. I went ahead and completed that number bond here. Lesson 12, I went ahead and solved it just the way that it showed me here. And I went ahead and wrote my explanation. Obviously, my students might not write such a detailed explanation, but I wanted uh, my students to make sure that they understood that really the part that was wrong was that she forgot to decompose um, that four tens into the three tens when I, um, when I regrouped. Lesson 13 continues to work with that place value model and uh, the disks. And so I can see here, I went ahead and drew it. And I also went ahead and did the algorithm right next to it, as I expect my students to be able to do that. Lesson 14, again, is my focus lesson. And so I put a little bit more thought into this one. Um, but I went ahead and drew my chip model, which is what my students will be working on. And then I went ahead and solved those. And like I said, I just went ahead and did that with every single exit ticket for that specific um, topic. And so anytime you're planning a lesson, you're going to want to make sure that you are solving um, the exit tickets as this gives you a big idea in terms of what students are going to be expected to do by the end of the lesson. I always like to focus on the exit ticket as my end goal so that I know what my students will have to do independently. So once I've completed all of my exit tickets, 
the next thing I do is actually get into the lesson itself. And I always start with my problem set. And so for this particular problem set, I can see that there's two pages. There's problems one, A through C, I'm um, actually A through E, and then there's problem number two that's asking them to do it without a place value chart. And so I'm trying to see in the second problem to see if they can just do it using the algorithm. So I'm gonna go ahead again, pull up my screen, and I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my problem. Now I've solved the majority of them. I did leave C open just so that I can do this here with you, um, but you can see that I've already solved the rest of them. And so I'm gonna go ahead and solve C here with you so that you guys can kind of see the process that I go through when I work on problems. And so I know that I'm starting with 121. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw my chips for 121. And I like to use just a marker and use the tip for my dots. Um, this is something that I think works very well with students because they'll take a long time drawing those chips. Um, and then if you notice, I also keep it in terms of five groups. And so I always teach my students to keep the five group uh, method. Um, it just helps them uh, be a little bit more organized with their drawing. So 121, so 100, two tens, and then one, one. And so once I have my dots here, then I can go ahead and begin writing my algorithm. So I'm going to write these vertically. So 121 minus 14. Now, if I have to, I start with my ones. I have one, one. I need to take away or remove four ones. I don't have enough. So I have to come over to my tens. I have to regroup one of my tens into 10 ones. And so I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I've regrouped one of my tens. So instead of having two tens, now I have one ten. And instead of having one one, I now have. 11 ones. Now I can subtract. Now, depending on where your students are, you may want to um, move away from counting one, two, three, four, and just having them start to subitize the idea here. So if I have got four, they should know that if I've got five of them, five minus four is just one. And so I'm going to be left with one and the other four just get crossed off automatically um, just so that they're not counting one to one. And so now I can see that in my ones, if I had 11 and I took away four, then now I have um, now I have seven left. And again, your students can count one to one if needed. Um, they should just be able to see automatically that there's this five, and so five, six, and seven. So I've got seven ones left, and I can write that on my algorithm as well. I have one ten, and I have to subtract one ten, which means I have zero tens left. And then I have 100, and I'm not subtracting any hundreds, so my 100 stays there. And so I'm left with 107. And so I want to make sure that I write that here, and that's my answer. So as I work through these, um, I paid attention to what types of things my students were having to do. This first one here, A, students didn't have to regroup at all. I can see here just by my model, it was just straight subtraction. And so if my students need that scaffold, I'm going to make sure that I have them do number one. For B, now I've had to regroup, but you can see that when I regrouped, I still had some left over to where I didn't have a zero like I didn't see. This zero can throw some students off. So depending on where my students are at, I may or may not want them to do C, um, depending on how they're doing. Um, the other ones that I've already done before the video started, I can see here for D, students had to regroup again, but this one was a pretty easy regroup. I regrouped from six um, and then a one and then just added some more. And then here's E. And for E, when I subtracted, I did have to subtract nine. And so keeping in mind that some students, it might throw them off to have to subtract the nine, but just know that those are my examples. Something else that I noticed too is when I did number two is that they both are essentially the exact same problem. I still have the 63 minus the 28. The only difference is that 100 that B has. And so this piece essentially, the regrouping piece is essentially the exact same thing for both of them. So if I have students that are struggling, I may model A for them and have them do B on their own if that's something that they can do and if they need that scaffold. Once I've done my problem set, the next step I want to do is I want to go ahead and select which problems I want my students to do. So as I go through this, I'm going to go ahead and um, skip A 
my students um, understand how to do this and they don't need to spend any time solving subtraction problems without regrouping. I'm going to have them work on B and C just because I feel like those are actually problems that will show me if my students understand it. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and choose two and I'm actually going to have them to both of them and so we will not do E and we will not do E and really it's not because I don't want my students to do this um, the reason why I'm choosing this is because within my lesson um, I give my students 10 minutes to do the problem set and if you look at if you look at the suggested pace um, for each lesson that concept development is 35 minutes but the problem set is 10 of those minutes. And so when I choose my must do's for my problem set, I have to choose, um, I make sure to keep it to the time, to the 10 minutes. And so I select what my students can realistically solve independently within those 10 minutes. So my second graders in 10 minutes can do B, C, and then number two on their own. So that's gonna be my must do's. And so once I've selected my must do's, then I can go back to my lesson itself which I have here. And I'm not gonna worry about the application problem or the fluency yet. I'm gonna come back to that in just a bit. Um, what I like to do is I like to go through that concept development and decide which examples I'm going to do whole group with my students. Now, again, if I look at the lesson structure, my concept development is 35 minutes. 10 of those minutes is my problem set, which means that I have 25 minutes to teach whole group. So based off of my 25 minutes, which examples can I realistically do? So I'm gonna go ahead and as I read through this, I can select which problems I'm going to do. This first one is having me do 126 minus 19. And if I look at it, I can immediately see that there is going to be some regrouping. So I'm definitely going to do that example with my students whole group. And as I go through here, I also want to make sure that I focus on some of this teacher vocabulary. And so as I go through this, I'm going to make sure that I ask, tell your partner how to model, how your model matches the vertical form. And vertical form is something I want to make sure that I'm saying out loud. I'm very used to calling it the algorithm, but I don't call it algorithm in second grade. I call it vertical form. And so that's something that I want to make sure I focus on. Um, as I continue going on here, I also want to make sure it says I drew one chip in the hundreds place, two chips in the tens place, and six chips in the ones place. That's something that I didn't do when I solved them. And so I want to make sure that I focus on making sure I call out each place value. The next example on here, as I go through this, um, let's see, here they are. So it's asking me that after I follow that, it's asking me to solve 137 minus 28. I can do 165 minus 18, 153 minus 29, and 186 minus 47. Now I have 25 minutes to work with my students. That first example will probably take about probably 10 minutes if I work through it step by step with my students. And so I'm going to go ahead and select Mm, this one does have one regrouping in the ones. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that one to do whole group with them. And then I'm going to choose. I'm going to go ahead and choose this one for the second one if I have time. So when I'm nearing that 25 minute mark, I'm going to decide if I have time to do 186 minus 47 or not. So once I've selected my must do's for my concept development, which will be working on 126 minus 19, 137 minus 28, and then potentially 186 minus 47, then now I'm gonna get back into my fluency and my application and decide which I'm going to do. So for my application, I can see that students are having to regroup, but again, it's only a two digit by a two digit. So there's no hundreds in here yet. So my students should be able to do this based on yesterday's lesson. And so I'm going to go ahead and give them some time independently to work on this one. And then for my fluency, here it's having me practice um, place value skills um, for today's lesson. So I can see here that this helps lay the foundation for today's lesson. So as I go through this, I'm going to go ahead and select this one here. Um, renaming my units, I'm not going to spend any time because my students um, are pretty good about being able to rename 
my 10 ones into 110. But if that's something that your students struggle with, I want to make sure that I spend some time on that. Take from tens or ones. That's something that um, it's letting me know here that this activity is going to help students know when and when not to unbundle a 10 when subtracting. That's something that my students were struggling with yesterday. So I'm going to go ahead and select this fluency as well. And so now as I see my entire lesson, I'm going to do my application problem, which should take all about five minutes. Honestly, for my students, I think it might take them about eight minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and on here write eight minutes so that I'm aware that I'm spending eight minutes on my application problem. Since I'm giving my application three extra minutes, my fluency is going to have to get reduced just a little bit. Now my fluency activities that I chose were place value, which here says three minutes, and then take from the tens or ones, which is two minutes. I already know that's going to take me way more than that. And so I know realistically this will take me about five minutes. And then my take from tens or ones, that's going to take me about four minutes. So now I've got nine minutes for my fluency. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that and put that here. My concept development, I know that I kept it to 35 minutes. I'm still over by two minutes. So when I take my class into consideration, I know that this is going to take me 62 minutes. If my math block is normally 70 minutes, I've got a little bit of wiggle room there. Depending on how your math block is, um, you'll want to take those minutes into consideration. My student debrief, which is my 10 minutes, that's the last piece I'm going to get into. And so that's what we're going to do right now. So I'm going to get into my uh, student debrief which is here. And again, that's 10 minutes, but three of those minutes are my exit ticket. And I'm going to keep this, and I'm actually going to change this to five minutes. I know my second graders can't finish that exit ticket in three. So I'm going to go ahead and put five minutes there, which means that I have five minutes left to do some kind of um, debrief with them. So based on the information that's here, I like to read through the questions and I always select one question that I'm going to address whole group with my students. Explain to your partner how you solve problems 1A and 1B. Well, I know for my must-dos, I didn't select 1A, so this is not one that I'm going to do. For problem 1C, use place value language to explain to your partner how your model matches the vertical form. I know I did 1C with my students, so this could be one that I might do. Um, in problem 1E, it says right here 187 minus 49 was 148. What's the mistake? What mistake did she make in the vertical form? Well, I know I didn't choose 1E, so I'm not even going to get into that. Problem 2B, which is those two that were side by side, I know I selected those. And so it talks about how having that third digit, so having that three digit, how that changed the way I solved the problem. That's a good one too, because I want to point that out to my students. So those are the two that I'm going to focus on when I work with my students. So depending on how they answer 1C, I may or may not go into 2B and ask that question. So I know whole group, I'm going to ask my students, why does my answer include a zero in the tens place? Because I want to see if they paid attention to the fact that there was a zero. And then I'm also going to ask them if having a three-digit add-in changed the way they solved their problem. I wanted to see if that was something that they paid attention to. So now based off of that, I've got my application, eight minutes. I've got my fluency, which is nine minutes. I went ahead and, and selected my concept development problems. So 35 minutes. Remember, 10 of those were my problem set, and I went ahead and selected my must-dos for that. And then my student debrief, I went ahead and modified it so that it's still 10 minutes. I just extended that exit ticket time. So I know I'm at 62 minutes. Once I've done this, the only last thing there is to do is if you give your students homework, you're going to want to select your must-dos for your homework. One thing you want to keep in mind is that you want to make sure that your problem set and your homework mirror each other. And so if I've selected B and C, those could be problems that I work on for my homework. And so I'm going to go ahead and select B and C as the two problems that my students will do independently during homework time. That is how I plan a math lesson. If you have 
any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is rosa.gutierrez at omsd.net. Thank you. Thanks for watching this episode of the Curriculum Cafe. Click like and subscribe to join the cafe for more classroom tips from the TOA team.